So we'll start Matthew chapter 6, 33, because it gives us some context here. But seek. First. Seek. First. Come on, help me out. First. Seek when? First. Seek when? First. first. Well, first is first. First is first. You can always know where you're at in your relationship with God right there. You can always know where you're at in your relationship with the Father. Is whatever you're in, did you seek first His? Did you seek first his? If it doesn't come up, well, what does the word say about this? Then you have an alternative. Hallelujah. <laughs> but seek, seek his, not yours. Seek first his. his what? His kingdom. And his, that's his way of doing things. Because his kingdom only functions on how he does it. In fact, his whole kingdom is established on his word. Because where the word of the king is, there's power. Amen. And all these things will be added to you. So, whatever you're going through, if you want something to get added, then you need to seek first his. Are you hearing me? Because the Bible's about a kingdom, his, about a king, his kingdom, and his royal offspring. That's why Jesus, his very, I mean, when he launches out to preach, he says, repent. You need to change your thinking. The Amplified says it this way. Side with my party. Because there's a new government that you are not seeing in a seen realm. And I'm bringing that back. You hear me? So you're going to have to change the way you think in order for you to access kingdom. You're going to change the way you think in order for you to access kingdom. And Jesus lets us know you want kingdom to be accessed into your life to where things of the kingdom get added to you all the time? Well, you got to seek his. First his. Not just first, first his. That means you can't make first yours, third his. Are you hearing me? <laughs> now, why does he say that? Because Jesus knew Proverbs 14, 12. He knew this verse. And he knew that it was said, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And he doesn't want man to be on the path of death anymore. Aren't you glad God doesn't want us on the path of death anymore? But if you're not seeking first his, your first step is in a path of death. So where's your relationship with God? It's that first step out. And that first step will identify who is in charge. It will identify if there's a little self left in an area of your life. You want to know if there's a little self left? See if you step out before it is written. Start making moves before it is written. Now, I realize the scripture says this, right? I know. That um, the plans, there are plans that a man has, right? The righteous man has plans, but the, earth, but the Lord directs his steps, right? So that tells me if you're seeking his kingdom first, then although you're stepping out, you're stepping out. First thinking, now, Lord, I'm, I'm moving in a few directions based upon my knowledge of you. Yeah. 
But in no way am I trying to go down somewhere independent of you. So then we already have faith. I'm moving in a direction that I'm wanting to see, is this your path? And you're going to direct my step because I have no selfish interest in this way, specifically. Because I could just as easily go this way, this way, or that way. Because I got a few paths here that I could choose, but at the end of the day, you have the right to direct them. Are you hearing me? So Jesus knows this. Jesus confronted this himself in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 24. It says this, and a ruler questioned him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all you possess, distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, looked at him. So he told him to his face, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Now, we would love to limit this to finance, but what Jesus is pointing out is he was determining who was actually Lord of his life. That was the challenge here, okay? This is a lordship scripture. The scripture identifies lordship. Who is Lord? He testified that Jesus was Lord because he kept the commandments. Jesus, on the other hand, says, you've kept the commandments according to your desire. You're calling how you keep it. If you're doing it because I said it, I'm going to say this. Sell it all. I'm going to find out whether you really have made me Lord. Are you hearing me? Some of us have a wealth of thoughts that keep us from fully submitting. But I'm just going to be honest with you. Many of us have this problem because of how the gospel was first preached to us. Uh, I came into town last night because I came to see my grandson play a little baseball game and half the church is on the team. And so they won their first game, hallelujah. So um, that's good. Um, But as we were coming, we were dropping off a couple of other grandkids. And when I stopped at the 312 light, US 1 and 312, a guy was standing on a box. He had a megaphone. And he began to preach. He was in a shirt and tie. Okay? And he began to say, can I take a moment of your time while you're at this red light? And I'm listening to this guy. He says, you know, while you're here, I should ask you a question, where are you going to go when you die? You have eternal security, right? Because unless you've made Jesus Christ your Lord, you cannot go to heaven. You'll go to hell where there's torment. I mean, he got this message, this, this tree of salvation, the way to enter, down in a red light. And I looked more, I said, that's pretty impressive that he was able to articulate a thought within a red light. Now, at the end of the day, I had no problems with that. I'm like, well, he's definitely got them. He's planted a seed of thought. At, at the end of the day, he planted a seed of thought. You know, somebody could, because God's used that thought on us on more than one occasion, right, the, to start knocking at our door to try to let us know life's a little bit bigger than just the time frame you're in. All right, I have no problem with that. I get it, okay? But you understand, the rich young ruler had the same gospel. Because he was only thinking in line to what must I do to have eternal life? He wasn't asking, how do I get the kingdom? Jesus 
when he presents eternal life, he talks about it from a kingdom perspective. In fact, when he preaches, he says the kingdom of heaven is like this and the kingdom of God is like that. Come on, are y'all with me? I mean, let's look at John 3, uh, 3, says this. Jesus answered said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. Notice he doesn't say in John 3, 3, unless, a one, uh, unless one is born again, he shall not inherit eternal life. Or Jesus doesn't say in John 3, 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot live in heaven forever. He doesn't say that. What he says is, he says, unless you, and I'm out of the New American Standard, guys, not TH, uh, the Passion. He says, truly, truly, I say, unless one is born again, he shall not enter or see the kingdom. Because as long as we have a destination mentality, then we will avoid responsibility. And the minute we reduce Jesus to his saving grace, and I don't want to go to hell, then we won't receive the benefits of a kingdom lifestyle on the earth today. In essence, we will, in all honesty, will want to receive his payment, but we really don't want to follow his bidding until we go to heaven. Okay. I would love to say this isn't true, but unfortunately there's too many believers that aren't actually following Jesus daily. And Jesus never said, come and be a Christian. Right. He actually said, come, follow me. Yeah. So what I loved about uh, Pastor John George when he came, we had some comment. He said, I never call myself a Christian anymore. I'm done with that. Amen. He said, because it's so watered down and not even truth. Because again, in the scriptures, it, we were only called Christians twice. And one time, the first time it, Christians were even mentioned were by lost people. So they gave the label, not even God. Jesus said, come follow me. So he says, I tell people I'm a follower of Christ. Yes. Amen. And a follower of Christ is different yes. from most professing Christians. Yes. Okay? Because most professing Christians want eternal life. Yes. Following is different. Jesus says, well, if I'm Lord, it's a little bit more than where you're going to go when you die. Because <laughs> if it was just, just keep the command, right? Well, you do it, you got it, and I'll see you when you get there. What he exposed was, it's not about living my character, my moral judgment on your terms. And even though you desire to do them, because you know what's right, the problem is it was always about submitting to me as your Lord. That I should have the right at any time to say anything. And you would say, yes, Lord. 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 Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes. Because saying Lord has to have following behind it. Yes. Because many actually say Lord Jesus, but don't actually treat him as Lord. Now, you know, we've said this in the past. Savior is, is what Jesus did. Lord is who he is. If Adam had never eaten the fruit and sin never entered the world, then Jesus never would have come as a man in the flesh. But Jesus has always been Lord. Jesus in heaven has always been in authority. He's part of the Godhead. He's already exercised his authority. He emptied himself of that and became a man because Adam lost the dominion 
that God gave man in Genesis chapter 1. So Jesus didn't come to restore heaven because Adam wasn't in heaven. He came to restore rulership for man. And at the end of the day, rulership is what you are created for. I said it's what you're created for, to be like God in rulership. And Jesus knows you're not going to be able to rule unless you understand the kingdom. This is not just about eternal life. This is why I've made this statement, and sometimes it gets people very uncomfortable, which I don't understand why, because again, if they just read their Bible, it wouldn't have this problem. But heaven's byproduct of being born again. It's not the goal. It's what happens to you because you're in Christ and your name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life and now you're a citizen, right, of God's kingdom. And for a time, you will transfer to heaven. But we will come back, just read the back of the book. Amen? Because, you know, many say, read the back of the book, we win. But they haven't actually read the back of the book because if they read the back of the book, they'll know we come back. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And again, God's going to be here. I said God's going to be here. So we then need to make sure when we say Lord, we're living Lord and not really living Savior. Because Savior, a lot of times, people who really just love Jesus as Savior make Lordship the option, which then puts a lot of things in question. In general. And I'm not here to judge that. God ultimately will. But I can tell you how you can be confident and secure in your salvation is when he's Lord of your life and you actually follow him while you're here. Amen? How do I know this? Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Y'all doing all right? Luke chapter 6, verse 46, says, why do you call me, and this is Jesus talking, Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I say. So what is Jesus doing here? Now, again, I can hear the religious right now. I can hear them. They're like, well, none of those people were born again. They really, I mean, they could say Lord, but he wasn't really. Lord is, is reduced to the following definition that Jesus defined it as. If you're calling me Lord, you'll do what I say. Because he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So we could say it this way. You call me Lord, Lord, and do what I say. So you can't say I'm Lord and not do what I say. Well, I asked him to come to my heart and save me when I die, go to heaven. But as far as, you know, following the Lord, you know, and, and, you know, taking the Bible seriously, I mean, that's a little extreme. Right? You're extreme. I mean, you're like... You don't, even, you don't even want to make a decision unless you talk to the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about what jacket I wore unless the Lord told me don't wear something. And that can happen. The Lord can actually talk to you about your clothes. Yes. <laughs> There's nothing off limits. Yes. Amen. At the end of the day, you know, I'm not going in a closet and say, well, what underwear do I put on today, Lord? And it's all spiritual. <laughs> you know? But I'm putting it on. That's what I'm saying. I'm putting on clothes at the end of the day. Why did I pick out this outfit? Because I went on YouTube today. And I'm like, what have I been wearing the last few weeks? Because, you know, I won't put the same combination because I actually had another eye, um, outfit in mind. And when I went online, I realized I wore that four weeks ago. Same one. So I'm going to mix it up a little bit. <laughs> I don't remember what combinations I have. I have a hard enough time anyway. I really need mannequins in my closet. So they have pre-laid out outfits, right? I, I, you know, we really should have garanimals for adults. Now, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. So for those who don't know what I'm talking about, when society was highly challenged in their fashion, there was a company that would try to help you match clothes, especially parents with their kids. And it was all for kids' clothes. And there would be animals on the clothing tags and if you match the animals then basically it matched it's kind of foolproof i needed that i still need that i still need that 
right? So for me, I go through, like, uh, my Instagram feed, I always get men's clothing show up. And I'm like, I would wear that. I mean, why? Because they did all the work. But if I walk into Marshall's, it's a nightmare. I mean, there's so many clothes all over the place. Like, I, I mean, Marshall said, did you find anything? Nothing. There's nothing here for me. <laughs> there's never anything for me. Why? Because I don't know how to piece that with my closet. My wife, she'll come in and pull this and do that. Next thing she got 10 outfits off of three pieces of clothing. It's amazing. You know, I'm like, wow, how did you, how did you even remember that was even in your closet? Right? Anyway, Lord is because we follow. And Jesus said, now some of y'all saying Lord, Lord, but you're not doing what I say. He goes on and even says this, just so you'll understand what I mean by what he says. <laughs> because this verse here is much like the rich young ruler. What did the rich young ruler boast? He said, I've kept all those commands since I was a child. And you know what? Jesus did not rebuke him and say, you've not honored your mother and father. You've not uh, with, with, uh, held yourself from adultery. You've not, not killed. He, she, he never said that. He said, yeah, but there's one thing you lack. I know you're doing it. I know you're doing those things, but you're not doing them because I say. Okay? So there are things we can do in the name of Jesus from a self and get a result. I'm going to show you in a minute. All right? Look what it says here. Matthew 7, 21 and 23, it says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Now notice, you don't have to be in heaven for that to happen. All you have to do is do the will of his Father. Amen? Okay. He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, cast out demons, and in your name, perform miracles? So why are they prophesying in his name? Why are they casting out devils in his name? Why are they performing miracles? Because Jesus says in 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Now, lawlessness is that I don't do what he says. But I'm a believer. I'm saved. And I'm anointed. And I'm going to work this anointing so that people will notice me. All right, it's quiet. It, I mean, I, I didn't know I went to the cemetery this morning. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Pastor, just preach something happy. I tried. <laughs> I said, let's do joy today because I was wanting some joy this morning. I'm like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you know, let's just talk about the joy of the Lord. But at the end of the day, I don't get to call it. Amen. Amen. And we have water baptism today. Amen. And whoever is baptized is saying he's Lord. Yes. And I'm telling you right now, we're in an epidemic right now in the church. Because we are not following Jesus. We just want to go to heaven when we die. In fact, many of us want Jesus to come now so we can avoid conflict. Well, the redemption draweth not. I get it. And you know what? I'm not here to stop Jesus. But at the other side, I'm not here to rush him. Because I want to do what he's called me to do. And at the end of the day, the greater one's on the inside of me. And I don't care how bad the world gets. Because scripture has told me, what can man do to me? Scripture has told me that the greater one's on the inside of me. The scripture's told me the gates of hell can't prevail against the church. The scripture's told me that I could drink deadly poison and it won't even harm me. Are you hearing me? Now, I'll go around drinking daily poison. I'm just saying. At the end of the day, God has placed us in the earth 
anointed of God with the name of Jesus in Christ. And I'm not like, whoo, can't wait to get somewhere. I'm like, bring it on down. Keep demonstrating and show yourself. And especially as bad as the world's getting, Lord, continue to allow our influence to grow because the world surely needs to see and know that Jesus Christ is Lord. But the first way he knows their Lord, the number one way the world will know that he's Lord is not miracle signs and wonders. It's not prophesying. And it's not even casting out devils. Jesus said, the world will know that you are mine. And he called you a disciple then. Because of your love for one another. <laughs> so Jesus is like, I got these cats running around in my name prophesying, casting out devils, and performing miracles, but they don't love each other. They don't want to come to church, don't want to submit, they want to have their own little personal ministries, right? They want to get groups over there so they can prophesy. That's called seance. A little personal word here and a personal word there. <laughs> Valdosta, we had somebody fly, come in, hot off the road, wanting to try to prophesy over Pastor Mark. Pastor Mark's like, nice to see you, and went on. And they kept coming. Well, because there's really God there. Then Joshua actually had a word for them. A word from God. And released it. But it had words like this. Commit. Submit. <laughs> learn. Be trained. Because the gift they thought they had the Lord's like, yes, but it only comes out this way. Right. And if they don't do that, then they might as well put another title in front. False. Because there's many that have a gift, but get false put on the front because they can't commit to a local body church and submit to their pastor. Okay. Hallelujah. Amen. So Jesus like, I mean, you want the world like just, just contagious? I mean, like they're just running to the church? Start loving each other. But yet, what do we typically do? We cry, where's the miracle sign? We need this so people. No, they just need to walk into an atmosphere of the God kind of love. But the God kind of love in its fullness, that's why Paul kept praying that it would abound more and more. He's like, listen, the only way that it's going to get to its fullness, because again, the whole premise of Ephesians chapter 4, and God gave gifts unto men. That's everybody. Verse 8. Then he jumped to verse 11 and said, and some he gave as, which is the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to build them up. Why? So they're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, you know, acting crazy and carnal. But they're becoming mature so that they could grow to the fullness and building up the body. Verse 16, in love. Amen. Well, love, the God kind of love is always hindered as long as someone has a selfish ambition. Has a personal motivation. When's my time? When am I going to get? How about this? This is not union. This is fruit. I said it's fruit. I cannot tell you how many times I'm like, man, I want to use, and then they blow it. And you're like, ugh. Wow. And there's nothing you can do. They did it themselves. I can't tell you how many times I've considered things, and then something happened, and they went to. And you're like, man, geez. They're showing they're just not ready. And all the while, you know, what, what the devil does, the devil comes in, he says, well, they're not going to use you, they won't. No. You have no, you have no idea how many times God brought your name up, but then you. In that place, you have to be different. Yes. Yes. Amen. You have to have whip that Amen. to be there. Not every place in the body allows you or affords you certain mistakes. 
You said, that's not true. Some are saying that. I'm glad you said it was. Because at the end of the day, there was a mistake Moses made, and it did not afford him. Because he, he says, son, you've been face to face with me. And you're going to hit the rock twice and not do what I say. It was a say issue. That was a say issue. Just speak to the rock. Water still came out. Didn't I, in your name, with your staff, strike the rock? Did the water not come out? I didn't say to do that. I said, speak to it. And it's cost you now. You don't get to lead them in. I said, you don't get to lead them in. So you can't sit here and think that everybody in the body of Christ, we all have equality, but not every fit that we have is equal. In fact, Jesus even said, now those that want to be teachers are called into particular areas. There's, there's double honor, but then he says they are judged double as well. Which means, oh, why do I get double now? Why are you doubling up on me? How come I'm getting scrutinized more? How come you're being a double micromanager of everything that I say now? Well, because you're teaching people. Of giving responsibility and access about things that I need to, and if you, I'm holding you accountable. Are you hearing me? So you got to get rid of it. So acknowledging God only with our lips and not with our lives have dangerous consequences. Dangerous, right? The Lord is to be followed, not just acknowledged. Not to just be acknowledged. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. How do we avoid this encounter with God? Well, it's how we got in. It's the answer. Look at Romans 10, 9 and 13, through 13. He said that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as, wow, I am in a cemetery. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you're not saved if he's not Lord. Okay, now, I am not saying <laughs> that it, somebody who doesn't know anything comes out and realizes Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, they believe that with a heart and they say, Jesus, you're Lord of my life, which is the first time you make the statement, okay, that you're not saved. Obviously, you're saved. But here's the problem. We have taken saved to one event. And this Bible never included save to be at one event. Save from eternal damnation and the penalty of rebellion is one act of saving. Another saving God will do is save you from dying of cancer. Or leukemia. Or any disease for that matter. You know what else he'll do? He'll save your marriage. Right? He'll save your job. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of... Sa He'll save your mind yeah. as you participate. Because <laughs> there's a saving of the soul and you have to participate. But he'll save it. Are you hearing me? So again, what this is saying is if we confess with our mouth... This is not a one-time event. If we confess with our mouth, Jesus says, Lord, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be... Saved. That principle applies always. That if I'll confess Jesus as Lord, you're Lord of my situation, and confess means supreme in authority. Okay? It's a supreme in authority. That's what Lord means, supreme in authority. So this statement, confess with your mouth, literally means make a covenant with your mouth that Jesus is supreme in authority. It makes a covenant. Now, we're going to have to explain covenant here in a minute. Okay, but it means you're establishing that he's supreme in authority and you believe because of his death, burial, and resurrection, then no matter what I face, he has an answer to save me in it because yeah. he'll save me from all my trouble. You don't have just one trouble. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go to hell when I die. That's one trouble. No, you ain't got just one. There's a lot of trouble out there. Yeah. And the good news is you can overcome them all. 
But you're not if he's not supreme in authority on how you move towards it because he's the righteousness of that situation. He goes on and says, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, who believes in him will not be disappointed, for there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, right? For he's the same Lord. He's the same Lord. He's the same Lord. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And there's not a situation I get in because he is Lord of my life that I can't call on his name and he saved me. I said he saves me. And man, I'm in situations. I mean, most I don't even, the majority of situations I get in are never self-inflicted. They're externally coming towards me. And then part of it's just under shepherd of his church. I'm the guy in the earth that's helping God build his church. So there's things that come against his church. And he said, now listen, they're going to hate you because they hated me. So again, it's nothing personal. They're really after Jesus, even though they're using my name. (laughs) You really have a problem with Jesus, not me. Okay, even though you're using my name. So, if you make a covenant with your mouth that Jesus is supreme in authority, okay? Now, covenant, um, let me say it this way. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Okay, that's typically how it is in the Bible. Now, for all of us, testament would be a witness, right? And that's typically how we, you know, structure that. There's an Old Testament and then there's a New Testament, you know, or new testimony or whatever. But actually, it's really old covenant and new covenant. So what we've done is we've forgotten that this is covenant and we act like it's testimony. Well, I'm in a new testimony, right? Well, testament is what was written out that's new and better than the old. And it's covenant. Now, here's the thing about covenant. Covenant is a legal binding agreement between two parties. Now, the minute I say legal, that becomes a buzzword for people. Oh, it's legalism. He's talking legalism. That's not the love of God. That is not the love of God. You know, under the law, you're under the law, you're under the law. Okay. Gotcha. So I'm going to give you a case in point. So... Um, you have someone in your life that has come to you and says, man, I really love you. I appreciate you so much. And listen, I'm going to provide for you and your kids, your family. I mean, generations, okay? Um, I have all this wealth, all this property. It's all mine. And you're like, you know that they have all of it. You know, we can name some names right now and y'all would think, yeah, they're billionaires, right? You would say that. Have all this. And and because I love you so much, I'm going to give it to you. And then they die. Now, what's your expectation? You're going to get it. Problem is you show up at the court and you're like, I talk with so-and-so. Because they love me. I mean, we had it, we were one-on-one. They, they talked with me intimately. And so they told me that I could have access to all this stuff and my fam- for every generation beyond. They love me. But then all of a sudden the judge says, well, I have no documentation that supports that. It's amazing how we want to say God's love is without documentation. In fact, what you would do is you would go to the grave. And you would look at the grave and say, you didn't love me because you didn't put none of it in writing. Nobody even knows we had that conversation. And I can't even access it. Oh, no. I can't even get none of it. 
I mean, you talk, but who not? No one knows. But if they pull it out and says, well, it's right here in writing. Then you're like, man, they love me so much. They made sure I would get it. Then you're glad it was legal. All of a sudden, now we're glad it's legal. Come on, I can have access. Can you put that in writing? Are you hearing me? I mean, how many of you would go to a home and someone says, you can have it, it's yours? Oh, great. Well, we got any document? No, no, it's, you got my word. Oh, uh, write it. See, even Jesus said, now listen, I'm going to give you my word, but I'm going to write it down. Oh, it's, because it's legal and binding. Because this covenant that you and I are in, not only do you hear it in your spirit that God said, but then you read it and you get to declare it and say, devil, there's a legal binding agreement between me and Jesus that the stripes he took on his back was for eternity to take care of any symptom I had in my body. So you have no legal right to actually come on this property that God owns and put sickness on me. You've got to go. You got to go. You have to go. Because Jesus, when he spoke to the devil, he didn't come and say, let me tell you what I think. Let me give you my... He said, it is... There's a legal binding agreement between me and my father that was penned by Moses and the prophets. You have no legal right to me. <laughs> Are you glad it's legal now? Because you understand, love makes sure. It covers it. It covers any condition out there so that you get yours. Hallelujah. That's why when believers come up and say, well, the Lord told me, well, where is it written? Because if it's not in the word, then it's not legal and binding. You got nothing to stand on. Amen. I said amen. And we're not getting into the fight right because we need to realize it's not about going to heaven anyway. It's about becoming children of God. See, Lord means supreme in authority. It means to whom a person or thing belongs about which he has power of deciding master or Lord. So it's not a problem for me because Jesus is not a dictator. That's right. Jesus is the embodiment of selflessness. Yes. That when he called me to himself, he says, I know more about you than you know about you, and I want to release you. In fact, Pastor Roddy said it like this in Kingdom Rise. When Jesus brought you to him... He introduced you to you. Because up to this point, you didn't know who you were. You didn't realize you were to have dominion. You didn't realize that you were, created, you were to be created in the image of God, and you were to be like God, and you were, able to, you were to rule like God, and you were to take dominion like God, and you were to be God's child and God's son, and it gave you privilege and authority and power. Over all the works of the devil, he's like, come on into the house. Let me introduce you to yourself. Let me introduce you to yourself. As long as I'm Lord, I'll continue to show you who you are. Because if you'll submit to him, all you're doing is finding yourself. Because you're in Christ. That's why Luke tells us that it, it's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Why? Because he's like, I'm the king of kings. And you're the small king that yields to me because what I say is love and life. And it pulls who you are out. Your purpose, your destiny, everything. All you got to do is let me be Lord. And Lord is you do what I say. And when do I do what I, he says? Not just in heaven. I said not just in heaven. Jesus' whole existence on the planet was, I don't do anything on my own initiative, but only what I hear. Ah, you mad at me because I'm doing my daddy's will. 
My father is my Lord. This is not a power trip. This is identity. My wife and I were at a restaurant last night, and we were, we, they moved us uh, in one section that has the bar. Because you can't really go anywhere anymore and not have a bar. Even, I mean, I was blown away when Cracker Barrel started serving alcohol. I'm like, wow, okay. I mean, pretty soon it's going to be at the, you know, ice cream shops. Anyway, so I mean, a huge backdrop. My wife's like, look at all that alcohol. I'm like, yeah, I know. She goes, wow. That's a lot of alcohol. I said, yeah, that's a lot of alcohol. I said, you know, and nobody's drinking it because it tastes good. Now, you can make a drink and then put a little bit in it and it mask it so it tastes good, like you coffee drinkers that put all that junk in it. <laughs> right? I get that. But I'm talking about alcohol itself. It's not good unless you train yourself to acquire a taste. Which tells me, how does alcohol even sell then? Because it doesn't taste good. Beer, whiskey, none of it. I drank once, I know, it doesn't. At all. It's image. Just look at all the commercials. They're selling image. And I told my wife, I said, and Christians that drink have an identity problem. Because there's only one reason why they're drinking, socially, that is. It's because they're trying to look cool. I mean, the, 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 the world doesn't show you the drunkard. I mean, they'll show it in movies, and then we've like made it normal, like it's okay that a man would get drunk and beat on his wife. And even though they can show us images of what alcohol really does, like the homeless problem, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to buy beer. Okay, then I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to help you. Because you want to be broke. You want to be like that. Hallelujah. It's image. Got the little glasses, the little cocktails, the little pinkies out. <laughs> Trying to act all cool. It's because they don't know who they are in Christ. When you know who you are in Christ, then the new wine blows it all away. I mean, it's amazing. You're like, Shh, I know who I am. And there ain't nothing else going to identify me. Nothing. Nothing's going to identify me. Are you hearing me? So is he still Lord of your life? Or have you reduced him to the God you are aware of in life? Now, how do you know that? Do you seek first his? See, when God ceases to be Lord God, and let me tell you, there's not a person in this room that hasn't had that issue after you ask Jesus to be Lord of your life. Amen. There's not a person in this room that hasn't had that problem. How do I know? Because when God ceases to be the Lord God, then obeying his word becomes optional. Because I know what the Holy Ghost is saying. On the inside of every one of us, it is written. Yeah, but, yeah, but, that hurts, man. And I'm just telling you, I ain't doing that. Okay, so I'll seek you second. And he says, now, it is written. Yeah, no, but you understand, there's it's got this problem here too. Oh, okay, you seek me third. Because you're walking down some paths that don't include me. If you just keep going, it's going to not end up, it's going to end up a little bit different than you're thinking right now. Because I'm supposed to be Lord. What would it look like if a whole congregation 
actually obeyed God now. It's yet to be seen. Now, let me submit this way. A congregation that does it doesn't mean everyone will be spiritually mature. And it doesn't mean that there won't be some layers of carnality or babes in Christ. Because even if there are things that God is yet to talk to you about in the pruning process of your life, he lets you bear fruit as an infant a little bit, like, wow, that's going good. Then he says, okay, now let's talk about these things. I want to cut that off. Didn't talk about it initially, right? Because, you know, I'm dealing with your mind. Your spirit man's great because I'm in there and you're like me. So, you know, we went through this season, right? And you saw how awesome I was and how much I care for you and all the things I've done. This is great. Now I want us to work together. So let's cut this. Yes, Lord. Well, that hurts. I didn't realize that that was a problem because of all the blessings you gave me. But if you say at your word, then I'll do it. Cut. We get into the next season. Wow, there's more fruit now than there was last time. He's like, man, it is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, but there's a couple more things I was noticing in this last season that I want to talk to you about because I love you and I want to release you. I need you to find yourself. So let's cut this. Well, yes, Lord. Well, yes, Lord. Well, yes, Lord. Well, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Or we reduce ourselves to the rich young ruler. But there's still one thing you like. Yeah, you can't touch that. That's mine. Identify with that. You're trying to mess with a part of my identity. And Jesus is saying, you really need to do Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live. Now, your spirit, man's alive to God. It's brand new. But your mind, right, your intellect, your reasoning, your emotions that are so well trained to live by sight, by things they hear, and do, all of a sudden now he's having to retrain, get you to repent, change your thinking. Hallelujah. Why does he give you pastors? Because pastors get to keep watch over that realm called your soul. I don't need a pastor. I can take care of myself. No, you can't. Because you don't realize that there's certain things you're overlooking. And from my vantage point and the anointing, I'm really able to say, you know, we might need to adjust this. I'm noticing a tendency. And what's the purpose? To prune for fruit. And we already do this in our regular sectors of society. We let education do it to our kids and ourselves because if any of you went back to college, they would tell you, do this, do this, do this. Some of you couldn't write worth a flip. Then you went into English and grammar and they told you where to put the commas. Right? And you're like, well, I wouldn't have done that. Are you saying my writing's no good? Yeah, it stinks. But we can improve it. So then you subject yourself to their instruction and correction. We do it in sports. I mean, there's so many areas. We do it with our own employers. Well, you know, we want to give you a promotion, but you're going to have to do da da da. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Well, money talks, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, and he's Lord. Yeah. You bet he will. Right. And he does for most. Yeah. And most Christians. Because they just want to go to heaven when they die. Yeah. Following God is not the purpose down here. But telling everybody, ask him to come to your heart and save you so you get to go to the place that I get to go to is what they're calling the gospel. And that's not the gospel. 
That's the door. Jesus did not call it the gospel. He called it the door. I said he called it the door. All right. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life uh, which I live in the flesh. I live by faith, and faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. L listen to this in the Passion Translation, and then if you are here for water baptism, I release you now to go change. One person signed up. I don't know who it is. But, and now if you're like, Pastor Earl, I want to do it. I didn't sign up, but I'm, I'm going to do that today. I just didn't let you know. Then go leave if you've got something to change into and come back because I want to do water baptism, okay, uh, with you. If you're here today and say, Pastor Earl, I did not sign up, doesn't matter. You can be baptized today. If you've never followed in water baptism and you want to do that, today's your day. All you got to do is move and we'll baptize you because what you're doing is you're saying, I am Galatians 2.20. And I want everybody to know that. Yeah. How's the passion say it? Look at this. This is powerful. The passion says, my old identity. Is that, what is this? What you got? I got a different T TPT. Well, you're on verse 9, bro. You got to go Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. I'm like, that looks different from my Bible right now. <laughs> Galatians 2.20. Oh, I wait for them, man. It's worth waiting. So you can view it with your eyes. There you go. Ready? It says, my old identity has been co-crucified with Messiah and no longer lives. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispensed his life into mine. Is he Lord? Is he Lord? I said, is he Lord? Do we seek first? I would love to tell you the longer you've been in church and the more you've grown in the Bible, the less you will struggle with maintaining him as Lord. But that's just not true. It's got to be a constant decision daily to crucify self and say it's nothing personal flesh but I will follow the Lord.